And welcome, welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotah V'tzibanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Thank you. And we are in the midst of Parsha Vayetze. We're talking about Jacob's uh, sojourn with his uh, uncle Laban, and uh, that is his mother's brother. And um, we're in the midst of all that and how he falls in love with with Rachel, right? So that's kind of where we're at in the story for now. Let me turn that to that and share the screen with you. So uh, we are talking about the fact that Jacob, of course, has nothing, right? And he t he makes a bargain with Laban that he will work as a shepherd for Laban. He will work for Laban for seven years. And in exchange, Laban will allow him, or give him Rachel to marry. And that's where we're at now. They've struck the bargain and they're, so he's worked seven years. He worked the seven years. And now he's told Laban, bring my wife, etc. So here we are. So Laban gathered all the people of the place, and he made a feast. So, uh, there's no Rashi on this until verse 25. And uh, they feasted. You can imagine they drank quite a bit too. And so it was in the evening. He took Leah his daughter, Vayave Oto a love, Ota a love, and he brought her to him, being of course Jacob. Vayavo Eleha. <clears throat> Literally it means he came to her, but of course it means he was intimate with her. Vayiten Lavan La and Laban gave to her at Zilpa Shivhato. He gave her Zilpa his maid servant. Leah Bito to Leah his daughter Shivcha as a maid servant. Vayhi Vaboker and morning came. Vehinehi Leah and behold it was Leah. Vayomer Elavan and he said to Laban. Jacob said to Laban, Ma zota sitali. What did you do? What's this that you did to me? Hallo, did I not? Rachel avadati imach. Did I not work for you? For Rachel, Balama Rimitani, and why did you cheat me? Why did why did why did you deceive me? Hmm. We are seeing the turning of the screw. Right, such an interesting, interesting theme of these last two parshiot. Right, Vahiva Vokehinehileya. So, I think part of what's going to prompt Rashi and, and obviously our sages on whom Rashi is basing this, the following comment is the fact that he only found out in the morning. And if it weren't, wasn't Rachel, how come it took him so long for him to figure this out? Here we go. Ava balayla lo haita lea. So the, the, and even the language, right? It says, um, he lea. It was Leah. But this is a, what we'd call a diok on the part of the commentary. In other words, it's looking at something in an in unusual, so in a specific way. It says, she was Leah in the morning of Abba but at night, lo haita Leah. It wasn't. She wasn't Leah. How, in what way? Yaakov simanin l'rachel. Because Jacob had given uh, indications to Rachel, signs to Rachel. Before I go on with that, the point was, did Jacob know who he was dealing with? Did he know that Laban was a cheat? He did. And to prevent that from happening, he had given these signs to Rachel to make sure that if she had these like secret signs, he would know, in fact, it was Rachel. So how did it go wrong? Here we go. And when Rachel saw that they were bringing Leah into him, Amra, she thought to herself, 
עכשיו, now, תיכלם ברכותי. My, my sister will be humiliated. Right? Amda, so she arose, umasra la, and she gave to her, that is to Leah, Rachel gave to Leah, otan simanim, those very signs, those secret signs. And this is in the tractate Megillah, Yud Gimel, in the third, page 13 of tractate Megillah. So interesting, interesting issue going on here, you know, because in a sense, of course, Rachel was was cooperating in the deception of Jacob. And yet, on the other hand, her motivations were actually unbelievably noble under the circumstances. And, um, of course, on the other level, as we will see in a moment, that, as I said, the turning of the screw, this is going to be a watershed moment, essentially, for the rest of Jacob's life. The Jacob who cheated his brother out of his birthright and his blessing is going to have to accept payback time. And <clears throat> there is a, a general understanding that when we say Adonai Eloheinu, when we say about this transcendent creative force, that we accept not only its existence, but its judgment of our lives, that that is part of the very essence of being a Jewish person, is to accept divine judgment and to recognize God's kindness and wisdom, even in the midst of what seems to be very uh, adversarial uh, circumstances, and to accept it as divine judgment that is there either to allow us to make restitution for whatever harm we've caused this world and to cleanse ourselves so that we can gain immortality. And that's, in a way, what we're seeing now as Jacob being the patriarch of the third and final patriarch of the three patriarchs, is that his life is quite unique compared to the other patriarchs, so the, compared to Abraham and Isaac, in that he has to he has to recognize what he did. And it's a great quality uh, if we're able to gain that understanding and accept it, and accept our relationship to God in this particular way. So, going on. Could I ask yeah, a please. question? Yeah, of course. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's about the trauma of the Jewish people, but if God's judgment is, we're so hard on ourselves. I don't know if it's anxiety, whatever. It's like we're, it is, you know, some kind of a coping mechanism to judge yourself harshly, but it doesn't work well. It doesn't help you improve, improve your behavior or uh, be willing to do the right thing. Uh, it gets in the way a lot. And, um, you know, that isn't addressed in thinking about uh, God's judgment. Okay, I, I, I hear you. So the issue isn't necessarily harshly, and I think there's in some ways a, a modern kind of approach to that. I would say it's judging fairly. In other words, for Jacob to realize that what was happening to him was happening, as you'll see in Laban's words to him, by the way, are quite telling. Uh, as to saying, no, this I had this coming to me. And whether or not one sees that as harsh or one sees that as fair, I guess, at least speaking personally, and perhaps because my life has been so privileged um, on so many levels, that instead of, you know, that in accepting these sorts of things, um, it allows actually me to feel a certain joy in my heart as opposed to an anger. 
In other words, the sort of why me, Lord, attitude is not helpful, right? And rather saying, well, help me understand why these things are happening so that I can judge myself better. And by the way, uh, I had read a really interesting and wonderful explanation of the word lahit palel, which many people know means to pray. That's the that's the general translation. And it's reflexive, lahit palel, right? And it's interesting. And that's because it actually means to judge yourself. And if you think of it in the context of the prayer book and so many of the prayers and the values that those prayers are trying to forgive me for using the word to inculcate into us and to make those part of our dna uh, you know life is a process of perfecting oneself and being able to accept criticism and especially being open to self-criticism not not in the harsh way that you're describing, Judith, because I would agree with you. Just being hard on yourself, by the way, sometimes is a way of trying to excuse bad behavior, but rather in a calm way, thinking through all the dynamics that are involved. And I don't know that this really helps, you know, respond to the issue that you're raising, but at least that's the way I tend to look at it. And I'm... I'm going to let you respond if you'd like. I, I think there's a level of acceptance here and that allows a certain inner peace and um, allows one the strength to go on. Well, feel free to raise this again if you want. Okay. I mean, I know it's it's complicated. All right. So anytime you want. Going on. By, so Jacob has confronted Laban, right? Why, Lama Rimitani, why did you cheat me, right? Vayomer Lavan, Laban said, Lo yasechen bimkomenu, we, we don't, this is not the practice in our place, la tet ira, to give the younger one, lifnei habechira, before the bechira, the firstborn, right? That's not our practice. Well, what exactly has Jacob been doing before he had to run off to Laban, right? Isn't that exactly what he was doing? But it's complicated. It's not simple, right? Did I mean, the, the outstanding question is, ultimately, did Jacob do what was the right thing to do? And is it is it saying that sometimes, you know, the path to righteousness isn't such a simple path? Right? Does it have more to do with experience and and the ability to face life in all its complexities? I don't have a simple answer. So interesting. So going on, let me make sure I have taken care of Rashi's here. No. Okay, we got another another verse to go. Male Shvuazot, this is Laban speaking to to Jacob. Fulfill this week or the week of this one that's how it's not you know shavua means seven right so fulfill the week of this one zot being feminine referring to leah's week okay and i will give to you this one too referring of course to rachel but avoda asher for the the service that you will serve me with which you will serve me on sheva shanim acherot another seven years. Hmm. <laughs> oh well. Okay. So Rashi has to discuss this phrase here, shavua zot. Because it's not clear when we're talking about a Shavua, even though normally it refers to a week, okay, <clears throat> does, um, or does it refer to a, um, there, there are problems with this, okay, because as Rashi, I'm going to let Rashi explain. <clears throat> Malay Shavua Zot, fulfill this, either this week or the week of this one. Right. And it has to, it's not this week. It has to be the week of this one, as Rashi's going to explain. Davuku. Okay. So this Shvua, right, is connected to the Zot. It's a, um, 
uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on the grammatical term. In Hebrew, it would be called smichut, right? It's possessive, that's, forgive me. It's in a possessive case. In other words, something of, right? The, the, the grammatical form. Shehare nakud bechataf. Why? Because of the chataf and what he's, let's go back into this, and that he means here the shava. Right, it's not shavua, it's shvua and uh, shvua, and that's typical of uh, the smichut case of this particular grammatical case, right, right, and he calls it Rashi calls it chataf, and he says perush b'shava, right. He says we would call it a shava, shavua shel zot. In other words, if we were to play, play um. You know, say it all out without the smichut. We'd say the seven of this one, vehen shivat yameha And what this is referring to is the seven days of the wedding feast. Begemara Yerushalmi. He says that in the Gemara of the Jerusalem Talmud, the Moed Katan, in the tractate called Moed Katan, means a a small uh, Moed. Of course, is a festival, but what it's referring to is the intermediate days. This tractate deals with the laws of the intermediate days of a festival, where it's not actually Yontif, but it's the in between days, such as the in between days of Pesach or the in in between days of Sukkot. Right, the if shar lomar, and you cannot say, you cannot translate this shavua mamash. That in fact it means a week simply by itself. She in other words, it has to be the week of the wedding feast, and not that it's a week. She in because if this is were the case, hayat tzarich linaked. Because if that were the case, we would have to point the shin. We'd have to put the vowel under the shin, right? And he calls it, Rashi calls it a patach, but ritzonolo mar kamatz. That's actually the, the vowel sign that we'd use is a kamatz. Here's an example of a kamatz. There's a kamatz. If you can, this is a patach right here, the straight line. There's another patach, right? So Shavua is spelt with a kamatz. It would have to be, and it's not a kamatz. But Ud, and not only that, she Shavua Lashon Zachar, that in fact the word Shavua is a masculine, it's in the a masculine word. So it would it could not say uh, Shavua Zot. It would have to say, first of all, it would have to say Shavua, and it would have to say Shavua Zeh. And how do we know that Shavua is a masculine noun? It states, Shiva Shavuot. It says seven Shavuot weeks. Interesting, of course, that the ending is a feminine ending, but there are nouns that have feminine endings, but nevertheless are masculine nouns. Tispor, okay. So Shiva is a masculine, the new, new number system, there are feminine forms, which would be Sheva. Shiva is the masculine of seven. So it's, and since this is an adjective describing the how many weeks, if Shavua was a, in fact, feminine, it should be, say Sheva Shavuot and not Shiva Shavuot, right? So you should count seven weeks. And for this reason, Ein Mashma Shavua, okay? So it cannot mean, this word cannot mean a week. A regular week, Ella Shiva, but rather just seven, the number seven, and the French would be Setana, right? Like in Sept, right? Seven, Belaz in Old French, and in and the Yiddish provided here, Ein Siebentlig, Siebentalig maybe, or Siebentlig, seven, Sieben being seven, right? Venatna, let's make sure it's, I've got this correct here. I want to make sure. Venitna, and we will give. Venitna. So, Venitna lacha. Lashon rabim. He says this is, um, it's plural. Nitna, we shall give. Kamo nerda. Venivla. Right? Just like we will go down and we will confuse. Venisrafa. Right, and we will burn something like that. Afzer lashon venatan. Right, so even this 
means to give. It's it has to do with give. Venitna, we will give. That's how you would, um, you know, uh, conjugate or the or de, you know define this ver this uh, verb conjugate. I guess. Right. Okay. Gam etzot. Yes, Jocelyn. Does Shavua also refer to oath or promise? Yes, that's Shvua, right? So the accent is in a different place. But whether or not it's related to the number seven, I am not certain. You know, I could go really way out on a limb and maybe make a suggestion that there is a that there is a connection. And I will tell you how. Because the fact that the Sabbath, the Shabbat, is on the seventh day of the week, right, is in a way, and the Shabbat actually is a little foretaste of immortality. And you could say that the Shabbat is in a way an oath that God is giving us, that in fact, life, there is the potential of immortality in this lifetime. So I didn't go in that direction. I went towards if it's an oath, does it have any reference to a Levin's, uh promise, their agreement uh, to to give Rachel to? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't mention that he took an oath. So well, I'm looking at it purely ling linguistically. You're looking at it contextually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. But no, the, the wedding feast was seven days. And I think that, but I think that number seven has, that there is some connection between the word Sheva and the word Shvua. Because they are spelt with Shin Bet Ayin. They both have that spelling. So, so it's, not, it's not relevant then what I'm... I don't about. believe so. I don't believe so. But in all fairness, I'd need to give it some thought. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I think it's, I see it more from a linguistic point of view. Uh, so let's keep going here. Gam etzot, this one too, in other words, referring to Rachel here. Miyad, in other words, immediately. In other words, as soon as those seven days of the feast are over, uh, I'm going to give you Rachel. You'll be able to marry Rachel. And so that you can work after you marry her. So it wasn't that he was going to have to marry. He wasn't going to have to work another seven years before he allowed Rachel to marry Jacob. He would he would marry her as soon as the feast for Leah was over, and then he was going to have to pay back with another seven years. So. That's and I think that's important because it's it is a little bit confusing and it's possible that we might misinterpret it. And I for a long time I wasn't sure about that, but the Rashi makes it very, very clear. And Rashi, of course, is referencing you know traditional understanding of these passages. So uh let me find the place. Okay. Uh so we have Vayas Yaakovchen and Jacob did so. And he, in fact, they he fulfilled the seven days of Leah, I believe we'd be saying here. Right? And then after that, he gave him, Laban gave him Rachel, his daughter, to him as a wife. Okay. Uh, let's make sure. Okay. Vaiten Lavan la Rachel Bito, and Laban gave to Rachel his daughter, et Bilha Shivchato, Bilha his maidservant, La le Shivcha, to her as a maidservant, just an exact parallel of how he had treated Leah. Leah got Zilpa, Rachel got Bilha. Vayavo Gam el Rachel, and he he was intimate also with Rachel. Not only that, though, he loved Rachel more than Leah. Ouch. And he served him, he worked for him, another seven years. 
So we're going to see. So we, the Torah then sort of introduces this dynamic here, this sad issue going on between the two sisters now that Jacob clearly showed preference to Rachel. Rachel was his beloved. And I can only imagine how painful it must have been for Leah in so many ways. So, uh, but again, uh, hmm, I think there's some lessons here for Jacob, at least from a literary standpoint going on here. And of course, we're going to, what's actually happening is that the Torah is setting us up eventually for Joseph and why Joseph would be such a favorite son. And by the way, okay, I know I'm anticipating, forgive me, but but of course, he's going to lose Rachel. Rachel is going to die giving birth to Benjamin. So Joseph will be the only one. And then, of course, he loses Joseph on top of that. So the seeds of the tragedy in Jacob's life is being sown right now, right now. Because had things gone the way Jacob had wanted, right? If Jacob had scripted his life, how many wives would he have had? One. He would have had Rachel. That would have been it. But life didn't go the way he scripted it. And life doesn't go the way we scripted. We don't write the script. So I will take the Lamed or Shemashanim, another seven another seven years, Acherot. So again. Od is another. Acherut is also another. So why the duplication, right? Right? So the the emphasis of this, and this is from Bereshit Rabbah, Acherut. Okay, so why this Acherut? He kishan l'rishonot. That Acherut. In other words, and the word Achar can also mean after, right? After. But he says, it. he links them to the first set of seven years. Let's go to the next page. Ma rishonot be'emuna, just as the first seven years he worked faithfully for Laban. Af ha'achronot be'emuna, he worked those second seven years, even though he got cheated into having to work those seven years, he worked them with faith, faithfully. For Afalpi, here's exactly Rashi's going to say this, despite the fact that these seven years came upon him through cheating. So uh, we will stop here and I will put the pay place and this will be a good place, God willing, to pick this up next year. So even though those seven years came upon him by cheating, Yes. His service as patriarch yes. uh, was done faithfully, Correct. even though he got it by subterfuge. Correct. Correct. You know, yes, no excuse. And maybe, in effect, that this is saying already that something's taking place in Jacob, right? That he's starting to realize he needs to wake up and recognize, you know. And of course, there are many laws within Judaism from the Torah on that talk about how we need to work faithfully for <sighs> to employ us, for our employers. We need to be good workers. It's very important. So with this, I'm going to stop the recording.